Welcome to Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute, hosted by Georgina Downer. Hello, and on today's episode of Afternoon Light, I'm talking to Scott Morrison, who was Australia's 30th Prime Minister and the 14th leader of the Liberal Party of Australia. And he served in both roles from August 2018 to May 2022, just last year. Welcome to the Afternoon Light podcast, Scott. Well, thank you very much. It's great to join this really good initiative. I think it's terrific. Oh, thank you. Well, I've had already two very good conversations with former leaders, John Howard and Alexander Downer, and it's wonderful to have the next chapter with you. I thought, if you don't mind, we'd start at the beginning. It's always a good place to start. Mm about your first entree into politics when you joined the Liberal Party for the first time. What made you join the Liberal Party? Well, I'd say my first entree into politics wasn't actually that. My first entree into politics was local government level in Sydney in Waverley. My father was an independent candidate to go into the Waverley Local Council. They called them aldermen back then, early 70s. In New South Wales, the Liberal Party didn't contest local government elections and didn't for some years. And my father had always been a very strong Liberal, but his father thought the sun shone from Sir Robert Menzies. He was his greatest hero, and as a result in our family, that was a name that was revered. And so my father was involved in local politics for many years, associated with a lot of other Liberals, some who were you know, members of the party, others who were that way motivated. And the focus was very much on community, it was on small business, it was on individual enterprise and effort, and all of these values which were very much part of our life. And my parents were very active in their community, serving in their local church and various other organisations. So it was a life growing up in a family that was focused on service. And that sat completely within my conception of what the Liberal Party was all about. And, you know, going through university and those sorts of things, you're exposed to many other different ideas. And none of those connected in the same way that focus on the strength of the Birkin small platoons ever did. So it was a natural place. And I was sort of interested in doing it a lot earlier than I ultimately did in the mid-90s, not long before John Howard became Prime Minister and Alexander became Foreign Minister and Peter Treasurer and that great period started because I was working in the property sector at the time for a thing called what is now the Property Council. And I was just busy. (laughs) And when I left there, I took up the opportunity to join. And one thing led to another. And a number of years later, after I was working in New Zealand, they asked me if I wanted to come and run the division. Oh, well, that's quite the elevation. (laughs) From helping out your dad as a local alderman to running the division, You said your grandfather and your father really revered Menzies. Were there particular things Mm. that Menzies had done that they admired him for? No, I wouldn't say that. And I think John Howard's book on the Menzies era captures this better than anything. And in some ways, it goes against the grain about, I think, how people like to think about politics today, and particularly many in the sort of journalistic profession, where it's a series of great, big, grand, dramatic achievements and events. What Menzies was able to do over a very long period of time was establish a period of stability in this country, which enabled Australians to become great. And that is the big difference between, I think, our side of politics and Labor. We enable Australians to be great. We don't see the country being a function of its government. We see the country being a function of its citizens. And that's what I believe Menzies enabled. And I think every government that has been of a liberal colour has always enabled, from mine going back to Sir Roberts and everyone in between. And that doesn't always capture the imagination. What is your grand vision? My grand vision is that you are able to do the best that you possibly can in a country that enables you to do that. It's a big thing to put on a poster. It is less, I suppose, romantic than some of the things that you know Labor figures go on about, those big moments in history, which they all seem to crave. But the great things of politics are achieved in the day-to-day where people just live the lives they want to live and succeed the way they want to live. I just always saw Sir Robert championing that and enabled my family. We had a very humble, modest family. My grandfather was an accountant. My dad was a policeman. We didn't come from any money or anything like that. We were suburban people just making our way. 
Do you think that the way you conceive of how Liberal Party leaders from Robert Menzies on focused on what the individuals in Australia can do for their country rather than what the government can do to shape the country versus these sort of rather yes. grand political projects that you see Labor leaders and Prime mm. Minister mm. advocate for? And it's part of their myth-making too. I mean, Gough sure. Whitlam was Prime Minister for a bit over a 1,000 days and yet you would think in the storytelling about the Whitlam years that he had a period in office to rival Robert Menzies. It's not the case. But in terms of those sort of grand projects and the myths and, I guess, storytelling around them in the years subsequent, he becomes quite a strong figure versus, I think, the figure that Robert Menzies is, despite being Prime Minister for 18 years. As you say, it was a period of stability. Actually, some very big things did happen. They did. Like in education, like in the Australian economy, home ownership, the Anzus Alliance, yeah. these are big things, but it wasn't about yeah. defining his leadership around those initiatives. It was about what is the individual contributing to their country and how is the individual shaping their country? I'd agree with all of that. I think our party has always understood how Australia works and who makes it work, which is Australians. When we were going through the pandemic, the one big assumption that I and Josh and Greg and uh, Maurice and many others made when we worked through that was that Australians will prevail. They will push through. They will do their best. They will exercise the sort of diligence and patience and determination that we need to encourage them to do to get through this. We need to do everything we can to support them to do that. But at the end of the day, it's going to require a significant effort on their part, which they exerted. And as a result, Australia was able to come through better than pretty much any other country in the world. But that wasn't based on some grand vision of government that was based on a grand vision of the people of Australia. And that's where I think we've always been. And I think that's a very important distinction that we need to continue to focus on. And if you go back to Menzies' time and his period, I think John Howard's book on the Menzies era is, is the best of all of his books. It's so eminently readable. But equally, I think it just captures the notion of determined, steady progress. There's a humility to, I think, our side of politics. It avoids the sort of narcissistic romanticism that others like to indulge in politics. We are political tradies you know, on our side of politics. We fix the stuff that needs fixing. We build the stuff that needs building. And we don't go around patting ourselves on the back forever. Now, some say we should do more of that in terms of telling our story, but it's not our nature. And I think that's one of the things why people have always turned to us when they have, when the country has really need someone to come and fix things and get things right again. They've turned to us because they know that's our nature, it's our character. And I think that was very much embodied right from the outset. Menzies founded, along with others, the Liberal Party in 1944, so we'll celebrate the 80th anniversary mm. next mm. year. That's no mm. mean feat for a political party formed, I mean, political parties are formed all the time. We've seen them come and go in Australian mm. politics mm. for our entire history. And of course, in the first 40 years of Australian Federation, we had quite a number of centre-right mm. political parties come and go. The Nationalists, United Australia Party, Liberal Fusion, Free Trade Party, Protectionists, you know the list, even a Liberal Party at one stage. What do you think was the secret sauce that Menzies had found with others to create that enduring Liberal Party in 1944. And I guess you have an interesting perspective, not just as a leader of the Liberal Party, but also running a state division. So you know the importance of organisation and grassroots politics. Yeah. Well, I think there are a range of things to contribute on that. There are older parties than the Liberal Party in Australia, but none more successful. And I think that's a very important point. And yes, we may not be in government now here or in my home state, here in New South Wales or anywhere else on the mainland. But that said, when you go back over our history and even recent history, we have been in government more often than we have not. And at the heart of, I think, Menzies' creation of the Liberal Party was that he was not setting up a coffee club or a debating society or an ideological movement. He was setting up a party that drew together the many strands of this country that was largely unorganised. And I don't mean disorganised, I mean they weren't formally organised. And he drew them together for a simple purpose, and that was to be able to win an election and form governments. The Liberal Party has always been about 
forming governments and governing. That's what actually gets us going. And Menzies showed great insight, I think, prior to 1944, when everyone was licking their wounds after another lost election. And here he was, actually quite animated, looking at a period of opportunity to establish something new. And he was quite contrasted to many of those around him at the time. And he was thinking what we stand for matters and is necessary to be at the heart of government in this country. So how do I achieve that? And so he set about bringing what was an extraordinary coalition of groups together to form a very successful political movement. Now, he understood that that had to be made up of people who were like-minded And so the values and the principles at the heart of the Liberal Party were the, if you like, the organising principle for all of those coalition of groups to come together. There was common ground on which to meet, and he defined it very, very well, those core beliefs and values. But he also knew how to build a machine. And I had the great privilege to, when I was State Director of the Party in New South Wales, to get to know the late Sir John Carrick very well, who was obviously there at the time. And when I'd go and have those long cups of tea and coffee, which I used to enjoy doing, and he would recount to me pre-selection results of 30 years, <laughs> and he could still remember the details. It was I could barely remember the one from two weeks before. But Sir John would talk a lot about those times, and you've got to think we were an organisation formed out of a sort of a post-war volunteer culture where association was very, very strong in this country, and he effectively mirrored that into the Liberal Party. Now, I think there are quite reasonable questions being asked today about, well, that was the right sort of organisational structure for 1944 and, and the, you know, the days that followed that. So how does that work today? How does society organise itself today? How does volunteerism operate today? And how is that best reflected in how an organisational in the Liberal Party exists today? And I think they're very valid questions that probably haven't been asked in that way for some time number of attempted to, but I don't think we've really nailed that because effectively we pretty much have the same structure of operations as we did back in the 40s and the 50s. And so I think that bears reflecting on. So my point is that Sir Robert knew what he stood for, knew what was important, knew that that of itself was of little contribution unless you could do something about it. And so he formed a political organisation that could give voice and influence to that by building a political machine that could win elections, not win 16% of the vote by shouting at the clouds and feeling very earnest about your deep beliefs, but being able to draw together enough of the mainstream and appeal to enough of the mainstream to be able to form a government. And that still should remain our highest calling. Two questions that strike me as important, given what you've just said. One relates to grassroots politics and the sort of structure of political parties. So as you said, Liberal Party was formed in the 40s when volunteerism was really high and Mm. people saw that as a civic duty, but it also was a social element, wasn't it? Because you didn't have TV in the 40s. There was radio, but, you know, no internet. So how do you connect with people you meet in person and you meet in person at meetings and events and, hey, political parties hold them so join a political party. In churches the state, were the same. Churches were the same, exactly, and your local footy club or the country fire off service, all those things. Yeah. So 2023, and I reflect on the election last year in 2022, especially with the Teals, you saw a lot of younger people very activated on an issue or a, a zeitgeist, not about governing per se, or how the country should be run, but just on particular issues. And they did stand up and volunteer. I mean, here in Melbourne, you saw Mm. Monique Ryan, now member for Kooyong, she was able to bring together quite a group of several hundred Mm. volunteers around certain issues, but not about a grand plan or vision for Australia at all, or even just about if I were to be in government, how would the country Mm. be run Mm. and how would I serve the Australian people? How Do mainstream political parties like the Liberal Party, how are they supposed to operate in that sort of environment when you're confronted against, I mean, do we give up on grassroots politics, which I think would be a shame. You should be very much connected to communities and that you do that through grassroots politics. No, I don't think you give up on that. And I think you make a good point about the Teals in that they weren't articulating or even pretending to be a movement to form a government. In many respects, they're no different in that way to the Greens or One Nation or the Caddo Party or 
they're there rallying around. It was a bit of a moving feast, what they were rallying around. A lot of it was what they were rallying against in some ways. And how enduring that is as a sustaining force for a political movement. Well, I suppose we'll have to wait and see. But it isn't a movement for government. It isn't a movement to actually run things. Government's far too mundane to excite people's motivations. And if you're interested in running a government, you've got to have a view about more than three things. And in today's political environment and today's polity, it has been driven a lot more by activism and, and emotion, I think, more than I've seen it in the past. And I understand the hunger for a sense of purpose and a, and a sense of passion, and that's been cultivated in younger generations, and that can be a very good thing. But what we need to bring, I think, as a party is a way to connect with those who have that passion and purpose and seek to relay how that can be realised by supporting a party of government. We also have a challenge, I think, on our side of politics, reflecting back again on the Menzies period and the many years they were there. Stability is underrated these days. Certainty is underrated these days. Having a job is underrated these days. And these quite important elements of things that make Australia as strong as it is, we need to champion more because I think a lot of the things that has made our country so great is increasingly taken for granted particularly in the media, they can become quite tired of these issues and seek for new shiny ones to capture interests. And that can really dominate politics in a sort of social media-driven environment these days. I mean, people talk a bit about our oh, politics has become more toxic. I think that's true. It's more toxic than I've ever seen it. But politicians are just as combative today as they were uh, when Menzies started the party and when Billy Hughes was running around. I remember Smithy, Tony Smith, the speaker, used to tell me when he was preparing to be speaker and he'd go back and read the old Hansards as uh, his first decade of parliament. And if you think there has been any unruly parliaments in the television age, well, go back and read those transcripts, Smithy would say. <laughs> You know, they're into each other. So the politicians are not that different, but the environment in which politicians operate is very, very different, extremely different. In the Menzies period and his success, there was a great appreciation, I think, about things getting done and stability and certainty and buying a home and, and the security of our region and all of these sorts of things. These days, the agenda is different. And as a party, we have to find ways to communicate the value of the things we're about not change what we're about, but communicate the value of what we're about in new ways. That's not easy to do. Reflecting on what you were just saying, I mean, the Menzies era, of course, the second term, he's prime minister from 49 to 66. That is a post-war period when the value of people would have placed on stability would have been huge because the alternative was what they'd just been through, which was war and depression and Correct. economic uncertainty, physical security concerns, concerns about mm. democracy, your whole way of life. I mean, the fact that yeah. people got some stability and reliability of jobs and the economy was going well and they didn't have to worry about mm. being, a, you know, their borders being attacked or their democratic system being undermined. Of course, there was the threat of communism. But that you're right, there was a premium placed on stability over revolutions or being disruptive. I wonder yeah. today, given, I mean, we obviously had the COVID crisis, but we have had a period of pretty good Times. I mean, my lifetime, From I was born in 79, I do vaguely remember the recession of the early 90s, but I was an early high school student then. So it certainly wasn't a time when I was worried about my own job because I didn't, <laughs> it was in the education system. But, but we've had good times and we haven't had a war on our territory or close to our shores. So maybe we don't value stability or the a strong economy, that that we have a job so much because we haven't had to question those things. They've, those things have been constantly available to us without really questioning that if they weren't, what was the alternative? I think that's a fair assumption and a fair assessment, but none of us would want it differently, would we, <laughs> um, oh, for our kids? No. I remember when I was treasurer, some of the hardheads would say in the media, oh, what this country needs is a good recession to teach people a lesson and that they can understand. And I thought, what a heartless thing to say. Mm. Who would want to wish a recession on their country? As treasurer, my job was to make sure we didn't have one and do everything we could. And similarly through the pandemic, I mean, the truth is that the Australian government, and I think so much of this goes to the Menzies period and governments that followed and John's and Tony's and mine, Malcolm's on, we focus so much on the stability and strength of government that it is quite an effective instrument. And when we hit the pandemic, the one stat I would look at 
as frequently as it was updated was the, our bond clearance rate because that was telling me what response we could put in place. I remembered keenly what Joe Lyons went through in the Depression, and he was a Labor acting treasurer at the time. And it, this experience eventually led him to leave the Labor Party and set up the UAP as a forerunner of the Liberal Party. And his response had to be very different because he had to keep the British banks happy. Otherwise, there would be no capital for Australia on the other side of the Great Depression. If Australia had done what Jack Lang and the Labor Party were basically screaming at Lyons to do, and Anne Henderson's book on this is tremendous, then we would have lost effectively our AAA credit rating as it would have been considered back then. And Lyons understood this. And so he was arguing for economic orthodoxy at a time because Australia couldn't afford to finance the type of response which others would have liked to have done. Now, when we went through the pandemic, we had to be similarly mindful, keep Australia's credit rating, keep our orthodoxy of economic policy in place. But because the Australian government was much stronger in 2020 than it was back in 1929, we had a greater capacity to respond to these situations. And Australia's response economically was second to none. And we were able to bring the country through a very, very difficult period. And perhaps people think, well, nothing can touch us now. The government can get us out of any problem. Well, I don't share that view. And nor is it a good thing to have to go and solve a problem like that. We did what we had to do, but it was not something we took great delight in doing, having to incur that level of expense on an economic package, but we could do it because of the orthodoxy of our economic management. So government, particularly, I would argue, under liberal stewardship, has been very wise about these things and built the government's capability to be quite effective in protecting the Australian public. But when the vaccine works every single time and you never get sick, sometimes you start to wonder about whether you need the vaccine. Yeah. And I think there's an element of that, but you know, what's the alternative? Let your country get sick? No, you can't do that. So that's what I think makes our job even more challenging. I mean, our success, I think, is, as governments in some ways has oftentimes put us out of job. <laughs> and as a result, it remains then the challenge to redefine what we're seeking to offer. And I think in today's media environment, we have to find ways to do that, which are very different to the way we've done it before. It's not just a simple matter of waiting around. It is a matter of, yes, time will pass and we'll see the impact of what the current government is doing. But at the same time, we have to connect to that sense of passion that exists in the Australian community and connect it to the things that we know we can deliver. Menzies brought together, as you were saying earlier, a disparate group of non-Labor, centre-right parties or some of them were just movements really, not even political parties. Mm -hmm. And we talk about liberal values, capital L liberal values, and some of them are small L liberal values. But it wasn't an ideology, as you were saying. So the, the Labor Party mm. originally was a socialist party, avowedly socialist. It's sort of more a social democracy these days. Socialism's less, is a bit on the nose as a term, I think, <laughs> in the mainstream at least. How yeah, It's alive and well in the government. But. Yeah, <laughs> as a term. <laughs> Aside yeah. from university campuses, most people who want a mainstream political career wouldn't say I'm, I'm a raving socialist. But with a party that has a set of values rather than the ideology, that means that there are differences of opinion. And that's something the Liberal Party has grappled with in its 79 years. And Menzies did too, although I would argue he was such a towering figure that people tended to defer to him. And given he was the first leader of the Liberal Party, he had an authority that no one else could claim. How did you find managing differences in the Liberal Party when it comes to, okay, we agree on the values, but in terms of, say, social issues or economic issues or environmental issues, there are differences and sometimes they can seem a bit intractable. And I'd say the critics of the Liberal Party will say, well, they can't be overcome and, and is that not the death knell of the party? I mean, it's never been the case yeah. in 79 no, I, years. but I don't share that. <laughs> no. I mean, the last rights over the Liberal Party have been issued many times and then you, <laughs> next, you know, within three years you're winning an election. So I, I tend not to indulge those commentaries too often, if at all. But no, you're right. I mean, he skillfully brought together a majority in this country. But I think he's well understood the challenges of maintaining that majority and its limits. Remember, the country party didn't come in. He worked out there was no way he was going to be able to get them in. But he also understood there was no way he was going to be able to win and form a government unless he was in a coalition with them. And this was another part of Menzies' genius. Menzies was not an ideologue. He was a strong values-based politician who pragmatically knew how to form governments and run governments. 
ideology doesn't mean values. And I think these two things are often confused, particularly in the sort of culture wars, sort of dominated environment we have today. Values are what drive you. And I think they've driven every big liberal government. We're reducing taxes to shoring up our security to responsible economic management, all of these principles, which are about creating that environment in which people can excel. I have heard every liberal leader in my memory espouse those and govern on the basis of those. So I think that's established. So the challenge is how you maintain the coalitions you form outside of the party and then how you maintain the unit of your party within it. Now, there are different elements to that. As a federal parliamentary leader, it's one's job to maintain the unity within the federal parliamentary ranks. And John Howard's advice to every Liberal leader has been job number one. That's the first item on your list. And he's right. When a leader cannot keep their party together, it cannot be an effective force at an election. At the time I was leader, I enjoyed great unity in the federal parliamentary party. First leader that went through a whole term and faced two elections as a prime minister since John himself. And maintaining that unity is not easy. When I became leader, I said to the parliamentary party, I'm not chasing people off to the fringes. I'm going to stand right here in the middle and try and draw people towards that. Now, that doesn't mean they had to come all the way to the middle, but it meant on occasions they'd have to come a bit of a way. And on occasions that didn't occur and that injured us quite significantly. The Religious Discrimination Act vote was a sad example of that. Thankfully, we didn't have too many others of those in a parliament where we were a government which held a one-seat majority. So maintaining that spectrum is incredibly difficult and it's getting harder. When you add the coalition to that and the spectrum that you're seeking to manage, it gets even harder still. And I think that causes us to sometimes wonder whether how the coalition is formed and how the composition of the party and its makeup and it should have become more of this sort of party or that sort of party. And I think they're reasonable questions. I think they're reasonable discussions. I don't think we should be afraid of them because we have to resolve them. (laughs) And leaders of the party need to sort of rely on that sort of consensus that exists to keep binding the party together. Otherwise, it will just fracture everywhere. You just can't come in and say we're this or we're that and get on board or get lost. Uh, That party's over within a couple of weeks and that leadership is certainly over within a couple of weeks. There has to be an engagement and that involves a continuing dialogue within the party. So you try and at least understand, if not address, the most fundamental issues that are being raised from those perspectives. You're never going to address them all, and there has to be give and take. If there's not give and take, well, the party's not going to be unified, and a leader knows that pretty quickly, and then they have to address themselves to that. But it was the hardest part of the job, and it was the most demanding in terms of its threat to the cohesion of the government every single day. So you're right to highlight it. During my time, I'm thankful for the great support I had from my deputy and Josh. He was wonderful. He was a terrific deputy. And I commend the way Susan Lee is now working with Peter in the Federal Parliamentary Party now. It takes a leadership team to hold all that together. And I had a great leadership team. And I was part of a number of other leadership teams that sought to achieve that. So you can't take that for granted. Menzies certainly never did. And it changes over time too. You can't just presume because it worked in John Howard's days or whoever's that it's going to work the same way now. Times change. Do you think the merger of the Liberal and National parties in Queensland makes things more difficult? I mean, I sit here in Victoria where currently the Liberals hold two seats in metropolitan Melbourne and I think cumulatively they hold seven seats in Victoria out of about 37, so it's not a huge showing. I mean, LNP has been very dominant in Queensland for many, many years, but its brand is a joint brand, a merged brand, whereas down here in Victoria, obviously the coalition runs separately and their identities are very separate and their constituencies are very separate. How do you manage that when you're the federal leader and obviously the leader of the coalition when you're prime minister too? Well, when it was formed, I must admit the LNP in Queensland, I was not a fan about this at all. I really didn't think it was a good idea. But I must admit now, many, many years later, the idea has grown on me considerably. And I think there are a number of things that have contributed to that. I mean, I think the time's different for a start. So just because something wasn't right then doesn't mean it's not right now. When I observe the LNP now, there are many members of the LNP now who were never a member of the Liberal Party or the National Party. They see themselves as members of the LNP, and they don't know what the difference is between those two things. I think the constituencies of the Liberal and the National Parties now are not as different as they used to be. I'll give an example. In my own electorate here in southern Sydney in the Shire, 
those who strongly support me here and the party when I was Prime Minister, but as just as a member of the Liberal Party, are no different to those who support Michael McCormick in the Riverina. It's the same issues. It's the same values. It's the same focus. It's the same priorities. And so I think increasingly you're seeing outer suburban, regional, rural consensus around a whole bunch of issues. Remember, that's where we held all the seats including, you know, at the election seats like Aston and La Trobe, seats like that. And there is a lot of commonality in our supporters between the Liberal and the National Party in those areas. I used to love going to North Queensland. I used to love going to Townsville. Phil Thompson is a Liberal member of the LNP in Townsville. How he's different, and Warren's a Liberal up there, member of the LNP in Cairns. How he's different to what we have in Gladstone or what we have in Maryborough or places like this. Go figure, I can't. The support bases are pretty much the same. So I think there's a bit of phony difference, frankly, between the Liberal and the National parties at a federal level. And I think that's highlighted by the fact that the LNP sits together in one room in the Queensland State Parliament, and they all seem to be able to sit in the same room together. And these great differences that apparently exist when they all come to Canberra Frankly, some of them might be quite phony. We don't have to keep locking into a structure just because that was the structure that worked at the time. I think we have to be more pragmatic at that. And I think the person who would be the first to argue it if they were around today was Sir Robert Menzies. He would be the first one to say, because remember, this is a guy who was in the UAP and just went, none of that's working. We're never going to win again. So I've got this idea that it looks like this. And most people would have thought he was nuts and was tearing down the great traditions and all, whatever. But he went about and he changed politics in his country forever because he dared to think about a new set of structures that might actually house these common interests together in politics. And I think we shouldn't be scared of thinking about those things in the environment we're in today. That's not an argument to change it, but it is an argument to think about it. And I think the experiment of the LNP ultimately will prove to be a good one I think the arguments that it leaves a uh, room for a right of LNP, country sort of voice, a CATA, One Nation thing, they're legitimate points. Equally, maybe that's what gives rise to what we've seen with the Tillman to some extent in our urban areas, or, which I argue in Victoria is even more pronounced than it is in New South Wales. When uh, Stephen Harper started the Conservative Party in Canada, I mean, there are still non-liberal parties, they're called over there, but non, let's call them non-Labor parties at a state level that operate under completely different brands. Mm. And they are completely aligned with where Harper's party was established. So I think on our side of politics, we're less constrained and I think we can be a little bit more innovative. And I think they're the hard things that I think Menzies would want us in this day and age to be pondering. And if the structure isn't right, change it because the structure wasn't the point. His point was to form an organisation that could put the right values in governments in Australia. Let's stay true to that and let's make sure that that drives the strategy, not the structure driving the strategy. What about regional differences though? So, I mean, I'm thinking about Victoria as opposed to the New South Wales and Queensland you're describing. So the outer suburbs of Sydney and regional New South Wales, you say the issues are quite similar mm. and the supporters of mm. Riverina and mm. Hooker of the mm. incumbent members are quite mm. similar. Yeah. <laughs> but in Victoria, I mean, in South Australia, the National Party doesn't exist, of course. It's, mm. it's just mm. the Liberal Party. But, you know, you do get regional differences. And, of course, the Liberal Party is a federal party in terms of mm. it has different mm. state divisions and they do have their own kind of characters and history and they do have different understandings around the edges of their, I guess, their beliefs. You're right, Jenna, and this is what I found quite puzzling during the pandemic. Mm. I'm a Liberal, which means I'm a Federalist. I like government being as close to the people as it possibly can be. I don't want Canberra to run hospitals. <laughs> I don't want them to run schools. You know, I would like that to be run as close to the ground as possible. And at least in my own cases, the closest I, ground I can get is sending my kids to a private Baptist school. <laughs> I like that connection between the community and government. And so when during the pandemic, some seem to be inventing this view that is a liberal, that the federal government should be coming and riding roughshod over state governments and stripping away their powers, I just found that jarring and a complete antipathy to what the actual point of the Liberal Party is. Yeah. Federation, does it work that well? No, if you can tell you as a prime minister, it can be pretty annoying, <laughs> particularly in a pandemic. Yes. <laughs> but, but, you know, if you're a federalist and you think government should be closer to the community, 
That can't just be a convenient view when things are running nicely. I remember in my maiden speech to Parliament, I mean, it was a state government in New South Wales at the time, a Labor government, I should say, and it was a terrible Labor government. Peter Costello used to call it competence creep, that when there was a bad state government, everybody wanted to elevate the issues of state government to the federal government when it was a Liberal government because they knew how to run things. And I said, well, no, I'm a federalist. I think state governments should do their job And if you don't like what the state government's doing, don't ask the federal government to do it. Vote the state government out and put in another one. That's how our system works. Now, if you're redrawing the lines now, would you have two states in Queensland? Would you have probably, maybe? Doesn't really matter. It's what we've got. And so I think the differences between states are actually quite profound. And I know that as a national leader. Values can be very similar, though. If I'm moving around the northern regions of Tasmania or the northern suburbs of Perth or up in Townsville or, as I said, out in the central tablelands of New South Wales or down the surf coast in Victoria, a place like this, I find very, very similar values, but the circumstances can be very different. The economies are different. The demography is different. The cultural makeup is different. And the history is different. The way people are used to doing things is different. And I think that has to be respected in government. And it's very hard to respect it if you try to make it all the same over the entire country. And if you're expecting Liberal to mean exactly the same thing in northern Tasmania as it means in northern Queensland, Mm. oh, you're going to struggle. I knew as a state director that our most effective campaigns were the one that had a great platform, which in my time, that was when... In Linton was the director and Brian Lochnane in my second one. And you had a great national platform of the campaign, but you took it and then you customised it both to your state and to the electorate. I remember we had the big signs at 2001 election. We will decide who comes to this country was that line. Remember, John started as a campaign. We got Linton a number of others got pretty busy on the signs afterwards, polling day. <laughs> but in New South Wales, those signs had one other line on the end of it, which what didn't appear in other states. Because what John said on that day is we will decide who covers this country and the circumstances in which they come. And he said, and no one else. And we put those lines on the bottom of every single one and on every single flyer because I knew how strongly that resonated in New South Wales at the time. So you do need flexibility, I think, in a political party that understands that the country's a bit different and let everybody breathe a bit. I wanted to hear your views on The Voice. I know in your maiden speech, which you gave the day after Kevin Rudd had issued the apology to Indigenous people in the parliament, so Mm. those issues were very much front and centre, and in your maiden speech you certainly made them front and centre. I note that you made an acknowledgement to the Darrell Nation of Southern Sydney and, of course, your electorate encompasses Botany Bay, which has an incredibly important meaning when it comes to white settlement of Australia. What is your view on The Voice? And I guess as a Liberal and the Liberal Party where there are diversity of views, it would appear on this issue, how can this be managed? Well, I, I support the party's position first and foremost as it's come through our party room, and I thought it was a very good discussion we had in our party. I don't necessarily think that may be popular. We'll see. (laughs) We'll see. certainly is with some, but that's not the point. Mm. I would prefer this not to be a partisan issue, but regrettably it probably will be. So let me sort of back up as to why I think what I think. The difference between the apology and what we're talking about now is very important, and even going back to the first referendum. Those were about recognising that fellow Australians were being treated as lesser than their other fellow Australians, not being counted, not being given the vote, not recognising the injustice and the harm caused, which is real. We can't pretend it wasn't. It happened. But I'm certainly not one who likes a black armband version of history because in that first speech I said I think we should watch it in high definition, full technicolour. We should tell it all, understand all the good and all the bad. The bad doesn't discount the good, the good doesn't discount the bad. It's just all there. It's part of who we are. We're a complex country. Not surprising, people are complex. So are nations. And I think it's matured to get that and understand it and be humbled by it, but also proud of it. So those two things that were done, and we followed through on many of those, particularly Ken White and I, was trying to remove the extent which was significant to which Indigenous Australians were being worse off than their fellow citizens. This was about an evening of the playing field because it was based on the principle that we're all Australians and we should all have the same opportunities and the same rights and the same dignity and the same respect. What concerns me about The Voice 
And I have no issue with the local and regional voices. In fact, that was the position we took to the last election. I think that can be very effective in helping local communities engage with closing the gap initiatives. And I think that's really important. And even nationally in a legislative form. But when you put it in your constitution, this is where I balk. And I balk there because this isn't about saying people were being treated lesser than, and now we want to make sure they're treated the same as. This is about starting to demarcate Australians on the basis of race Mm. and to say that one group are going to have a particular set of representations that others are not. Now, that same argument would apply if it was to fully abled and disabled Australians, to those who are born here or not born here. I don't think any of these things should be a reason for demarcation in our foundational document. Now, it's not a particularly sexy argument, and I don't think it's really going to necessarily capture the hearts and minds of people. But if you ask me why do I don't think the Constitution should be changed, is that I think the Constitution as a foundational document should treat all Australians equally. And I don't think this does that. That disappoints me. That doesn't mean I don't support there being better ways of Indigenous communities expressing their views to government. I'd love that. And we had some good representation of Indigenous communities. I mean, I appointed the first ever Indigenous person to Cabinet and to be the Minister for Indigenous Australians. The Liberal Party has a proud boast in terms of Indigenous representation in our ranks, now taken up by Jacinta and, and others. So this is great. But the foundational document of our country can't differentiate between Australians. And look, I agree there are technical issues around the fact that it relates to executive government and things like that. That's also true. And that's why I think it is wrong-headed in the way that it's been constructed. It's something that's well-intentioned. I think it's constructed, though, more around sentiment than, I think, sound policy. And as a result, I mean, one of our colleagues said, lives in an area, and I won't name them because, I mean, if they want to say this, they can say it personally themselves. But I would hate people in the cities to think that just by supporting this, that somehow this has achieved something transformational to the everyday lives of Indigenous boys and girls growing up in this country. might make you feel better, but it's not going to change their circumstances. That doesn't mean to say symbolism doesn't have a role in nation building. That's why I supported the apology. It can. But on this occasion, I think the sentiment has taken the proposal, the well-intentioned sentiment I'd underline, has taken it into an ineffective and dangerous place for our constitution about who we are as a country. So it's hard to put that in a tweet or a a quick grab on the news, and that's probably why you haven't heard me say much about it. As Prime Minister, we wanted to do Indigenous recognition. I and Ken couldn't find a formula that would bring Australia together on that question, and I chose not to divide the country. Mm. And I think not dividing the country over that issue, where of itself I could see it not materially impacting the lives of Indigenous Australians. It's a big price to pay to divide the country over something like that. So we chose not to go down that path, and I think that was the right decision. We wanted to go down, form a legislated based voice, starting with local and regional communities. We completely restructured the Closing the Gap initiative with the Coalition of Indigenous Peaks with Pat, who was just great to work with. And we got a lot done. And there's no shortage of, of goodwill, sentiment, commitment, funds, purpose, going into this area, it's just really, really hard. And you can't make it less hard or make people think it's simple and easy by just turning it into a yes and no question. Yeah, absolutely. Scott, I have one final question. It's been an absolutely fabulous discussion and it's something that I know is close to your heart and defines you and that's your faith. Again, in your maiden speech, you spoke a lot about the importance of your faith and your Christian values from your upbringing onwards and, of course, the key figures in your life and the importance of your family. How hard is it to be a Christian in politics these days? When Robert Menzies was leader in the 1940s, 50s and 60s. It was very normal, wasn't controversial. But to be someone who really professes a strong Christian faith is sometimes being painted as extreme, as a bit strange, you're out of kilter with the rest of society. And you know, it's questioned in a way that you couldn't imagine it being questioned. I, mean, I even think 20, 30 years ago, it wouldn't have been an issue in the 80s, even in the 90s. But these days, it seems to me it's become quite a burden to carry. When I happily carry. Which, yeah. But no, your, your analysis is right. I mean, in, in Menzies' time, the overwhelming majority, I think about 90%, would have expressed an affiliation with Christianity. That doesn't mean they went to church every week or it was a 
necessarily the biggest part of their lives, but they considered themselves, if asked, you know, Christian aligned, and the majority of those groups were Catholic and Anglican and so on. And that prevailed for a long period of time, but it sort of steadily fell over time. And to the most recent census, where for the first time, less than 50%, 44% of Australians identified nominally as being associated with a Christian religion. So clearly not the majority anymore, at least from that perspective. The thing that I think has changed is not only has that number declined, but an antipathy has developed towards it, which didn't exist before. Even before, if people weren't Christian, they, I think, recognised that it had a positive impact in their community. They could see the work. And you know what? All of that work is still going on. None of that's changed. But there have been other elements that I think those quite antipathetic to religion have highlighted. And some of those things are terrible. And they've occurred in all parts of, of this society. And uh, you know, the church needs to address those. And I'm particularly talking about what the Royal Commission to Institutional Child Sexual Abuse uncovered, but there have been other things. And I think that was a good thing to do. And as a result, I think there has been a, a lack of confidence and a lack of trust that is built in towards religion generally, but particularly in relation to the Christian faith. But for me, my faith remains in the same way as it did for Sir Robert. I remember I wrote a forward for a book about Sir Robert's faith, which I enjoyed reading, and he had a very humble faith. It was a very quiet and personal faith, which I think was consistent with that time. And what I liked about Sir Robert's faith is how it kept him grounded and it kept him, as I say, humble. There was a humility, I think, to his approach, which I endeavoured to emulate through my own faith. That's what I found my faith does. It reminds you of your vulnerability. It doesn't remind you of other things. And I think that's just an important part of who I am. So I think Western society generally, this is a trend that is occurring everywhere. You'll find the same stats in Canada, New Zealand, United Kingdom, even in the United States, you see it coming down. And we've sort of got, regrettably, I think, to a sort of post-Christian society where we think all the great values that we have about you know, equal rights and human rights and uh, principles of even democracy itself and the need to have strong education and health systems. All of this came out of a Christian tradition, mm. all of it. Mm. And now somehow we think God's got nothing to do with it. It's something of our own moral invention, which I find not persuasive. But that's where society is today. But as a Christian, whether it be in politics or anywhere else, I just feel called to you know, be true to my faith. And I've never mixed my politics and my faith. I've never cheapened either by doing that. They're different. One informs who I am. Politics is about what I've done in public policy and in government. Everyone has their influences. That's certainly one of mine, but I've never seen it as a textbook when people would argue with me about climate change. And they'd argue me from a Christian perspective on both sides of the argument, (laughs) which sort of makes the point. Yeah. Yeah, I have my view on it. Guess what? You won't find my view about it in the Bible, and I won't find yours either. It's about politics. <laughs> Faith's a different matter. And that doesn't mean the, the separation of church and state is not the separation of faith from the life of society. God forbid, literally. But it is about managing that. And on occasion, I think people would have been disappointed with how they thought I managed it. But I always endeavoured to try and keep those lines very clear between the two. And I think faith and not just my own Christian faith, but faith more generally is a humbling thing for people, which I think is a good thing for community. Whether you're walking into a Hindu temple or a Jewish synagogue or a Muslim mosque or any of these things, a Christian church, whether it be a cathedral or in an industrial estate where a lot of the churches I go to go to, you'll find people who who care passionately about community, that reach out to those who are less fortunate, that care for each other in times of difficulty. We certainly saw that in the pandemic stepping in massively. And I just thank God for that. And I'm pleased to be part of it. Well, thank you for sharing those views and your beliefs with me and our listeners on Afternoon Light, Scott. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you, the 30th Prime Minister and 14th Leader of the Liberal Party, about... May there be many more. (laughs) Yes, indeed. Well, as you said, the death of the Liberal Party has forever been forecasted and still hasn't happened, so uh, I presume it'll kick on for a few more years. Thank you so much, Scott. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks a lot. Great to be with you. That's it for this week's episode of Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute. Please make sure to subscribe and catch up on our latest online content on our website or on Twitter, LinkedIn or Facebook. 